Okay, I think if you're good to go, then we we can already start. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start by thanking the organizers, uh, Hector and Daniel, for organizing this conference and for inviting me to speak here. Um, when I, when, what I'm going to talk about today is an interaction between uh, low dimensional contact topology and um, cyber grid and gauge theory. Um, so the rough plan for the talk is the following. Um, I'm going to start by giving some general background on what this story is about. And then I'll describe the main results and a bunch of applications. And um, yeah, for the second half of the talk, the plan will roughly be to um, explain in detail uh, this monopole invariant um, in, in some detail and sketch the proof of the main theorem. Um, so please uh, feel free to stop me uh, if you have any questions. OK, um, so. For the remainder of this talk, Y is going to denote a closed-oriented free manifold. Um, so the geometric structure we are going to be interested in is a contact form on Y, which is a one form that satisfies this condition. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and the contact structure is going to be an oriented co-dimension one distribution, in other words, a subbundle of the tangent bundle, uh, which is the kernel of a contact form. And a contact manifold is just going to be a pair consisting of a three manifold equipped with a contact structure. Um, so let me say that this is a non-integrability condition. And this implies uh, that the contact structure is sufficiently generic uh, so that it is not locally tangent to any surface in your three manifold. Um, the local model to have in mind is the following. Uh, you take y equals to r3. And you take the contact structure, which is the kernel of the one form uh, displayed here. Um, this is the picture that I that I have put on the right hand side. And the point of this example is that it is the local model for any uh, contact manifold by a Darboux theorem version uh, in in the contact world. <laughs> but as I, as I said, we're going to be uh, mostly caring about uh, closed examples. And the, the best one to have in mind is the standard three sphere uh, with, this, with the contact structure, uh, which arises as the field of so-called complex tangencies. In other words, I is the standard uh, complex structure in R4. And this is the two plane consisting of vectors tangent to the three sphere, which remain tangent uh, when, while we, after we act by the standard complex structure. And this is explicitly given by the kernel of this contact form. OK, um, so given some contact manifold, um, there's three uh, interesting spaces associated with it. Um, the first one is the space of uh, contact structures, which are in the path component of a given one. Um, then there is the, the identity component in the group of diffeomorphisms of the free manifold Y. And then we have the so-called group of contactomorphisms. Uh, which consists of those diffeomorphisms of our free manifold uh, that preserve the contact structure. Uh, in other words, while we, uh, when we push the contact structure by these diffeomorphisms, uh, we obtain the contact structure back again. Um, these three spaces are related by means of a vibration uh, with total space group of diffeomorphisms and base uh, space of contact structures. And the, and the vibration projection just sends a diffeomorphism to the contact structure uh, given by pushing uh, psi naught along phi. Um, and it's a consequence of so-called Gray's stability theorem, uh, which is sort of the contact version of Moser's uh, trick, um, which says that this is indeed a vibration with fiber, the group of contact morphisms. OK, um, so the goal of this talk is somehow to obtain information about the homology or homotopy groups of these two spaces, the spaces of contact structures and the group of contact amorphisms, uh, by means of uh, cyber grid and gauge theory. Um, and just for some context, I'll let me mention a couple of interesting results. Um, so Eli Ashberg has shown that if you take the standard three sphere with the standard contact structure that I described earlier, uh, this has the homotopy type of the two-sphere. And if you look at the three torus, 
uh, equipped with any of these contact structures, uh, then the fundamental group of the space of contact structures uh, is isomorphic to the integers. Okay, so the main player in this talk is going to be so-called contact invariant. Um, and I'd like to start by giving some motivation uh, for this invariant. Um, so recall that the cyber witten invariant associates to a closed oriented four manifold together with a spin C structure, uh, an integer invariant. Um, the cyber witten invariant together with the monopole FLIR homology groups um, make up for a so-called topological quantum field theory, uh, which in concrete terms means that uh, we have a restriction map which to a compact oriented four manifold with a spin C structure uh, with boundary Y and the spin C structure restricting over the boundary to a given spin C structure on Y uh, produces a canonical element in the monopole flare homology of Y. I will uh, give some background on what these uh, flare homology groups are uh, later on during the talk. Okay, but uh, having these principles in mind, um, the contact invariant, uh, which was defined by Kronheimer and Rufka, uh, associates to a closed uh, contact free manifold a uh, canonical element in the monopole FLIR cohomology of Y. Um, in the component of the canonical spin C structure induced by the contact structure. Um, I, I might say something about that later. Okay, so um, what's the basic idea behind this construction? Uh, the basic idea is that um, to a contact manifold, you can associate a canonical uh, compact for manifold K uh, together with a spin C structure on, on, this, uh, on this manifold. Um, and the boundary of, of this manifold will be minus Y, in other words, Y with the reversed orientation. And the spin C structure will restrict to the uh, spin C structure given by the contact structure. Um, from this point on, then applying the DQFT restriction map should produce an element in this FLIR homology group, uh, which by some sort of uh, poincare lefschetz duality can show uh, of, of these homology groups, uh, you can show it's isomorphic to the monopole FLIR cohomology. Um, and yeah, I will, I, will give the, I will give more details about this construction uh, later on. Um, yeah, so I, here I wrote down compact with inverted, with inverted commas, uh, which means that this is not really compact, uh, but as we'll see, it does play the role of a compact for manifold. Um, yeah, we'll see this later. Okay, so uh, a useful property of this contact invariant, uh, which was uh, shown in, by Gigini uh, in the context of a Cassin theory, um, hegard fleur homology, and, and, and a monopole for homology proof uh, appears uh, in work of Echevarria. Um, so this property is that if you have a so-called strongly, strongly symplectically fillable uh, contact manifold, then the contact invariant of its contact structure is non-vanishing. Um, I won't really define what this condition means, strongly symplectically fillable, but it somehow means that it's the nice uh, boundary of a symplectic uh, compact four manifold. Um, and to put things in context, uh, you can compare this to a uh, groundbreaking result of Taubes uh, that says that if you have a closed symplectic four manifold, then it's cyber with an invariant uh, for the canonical spin C structure given by the symplectic structure uh, is, is non-vanishing. So this is a contact analog of this result. Um, yeah, so the goal um, is to extend this invariant of Knoheimer and Murfka to families of contact structures. So let me be a, mo a bit more precise about what's a family. So uh, for simplicity, uh, N, uh, let N denote a closed uh, oriented manifold. Uh, and by an N family of contact structures, I'll just mean a smooth map into the space of uh, contact structures. Uh, so I'll use this notation. Uh, xi n will denote the, the family map 
uh, points in U are denoted by, sorry, points in N are denoted by the letter U and a particular contact structure is Xi sub U. And, uh, well, and if you're worrying about what it means for a map into this space to be smooth, just uh, note that uh, this space uh, is naturally a fresh manifold, so smooth maps into it make perfect sense. Um, yeah, so it's, it's good to have the following uh, example in mind. As usual, the example is the three sphere. Um, and we take as parameterizing space the two sphere. Um, so then we have this uh, family of contact structures parameterized by the two sphere, which is given by the kernel of this uh, linear combination of one forms. So here U1, U2, U3 are the standard coordinates in R3 and the two sphere sits inside R3. Um, and these are the three contact forms. So it turns out that all linear combinations of these three contact forms give you also a contact form. And when this happens, you call this a uh, linear contact sphere. Uh, anyway, just some terminology. And um, out of this example, you can produce many more. For example, you can uh, consider a finite subgroup of SU2. This will act on the three sphere, preserving the three contact forms from above. And uh, this will give you an S2 family of contact structures on the quotients of S3 by finite groups of SU2. And uh, the three manifolds arising from these constructions uh, are the, from this construction are called the links uh, of the singularity of the origin in C2 quotiented by gamma. And these are precisely the so-called ADE singularities. Um, and you know, three manifolds that arise from, from these quotients include spaces like RP3, a bunch of lens spaces, uh, or the Poincare homology sphere. Um, yeah, um, any questions up to this point? Okay, uh, I guess I'll continue. Um, okay, so the, uh, the goal of this talk is to extend the contact invariant to a families invariant. Um, in its most simple version, uh, this can be understood as a map from the space of homotopy classes of maps from N into the space of contact structures um, to the monopole FLIR homology, the cohomology of Y. Um, more generally, what we actually get is a homomorphism from the singular homology of the space of contact structures into the FLIR cohomology of Y. And I, I, I mean, I mean more generally because uh, there's a, there's a map from here into here, um, given by pushing the fundamental class of the closed manifold N into the homology of the space of contact structures. So, um, so this map factors through this one. Um, but for this talk, I, I will just uh, focus on on this one because uh, it's uh, it's just easier to deal with. Uh, with this invariant. Um, yeah, so I, I, I will postpone the uh, construction of this invariant until later. And now we will just, uh, I, I will discuss some formal properties uh, that it has and a few examples uh, to, that illustrate why these properties are interesting. Um, yeah, so we will see soon uh, when I do some uh, background, when I give some background about these groups, uh, that the FLIR homology and cohomology groups are in fact modules over uh, the ring of polynomials uh, in the variable U. Uh, and um, then there's the question of uh, how does the, how does U act on the family's contact invariant? Um, if you look at the simplest case possible, uh, which is when uh, when n, the parameterizing space, uh, is just a point. In other words, the the single uh, the single contact invariant. Uh, then, in fact, it is known that uh, U annihilates uh, annihilates the the single contact invariant. Um, and this fact is clear from the point of view of the Cassin theories 
Hagar clear homology or embedded contact homology. Wait, sorry, can you say what's the action of you? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I haven't defined it yet. Sorry, I, I will, I will, uh, I will define it later in the talk. Okay. For the moment, let's just uh, let's just assume that uh, these these uh, groups actually have a modular structure over the ring of polynomials. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Okay. Um, I will focus for simplicity uh, in a particular case uh, that when n is a closed oriented surface. Um, so in this case, I'm going to describe uh, what this U action looks like. Uh, for that, let me introduce some terminology. So uh, we start by fixing our favorite, favorite base point in, in Y. And uh, let's denote by this the Grassmannian of oriented planes inside of this tangent space, um, which you identify very easily, you can identify very easily with the two sphere. Um, and um, then there is this um, natural evaluation map from the space of contact structures uh, into this Grassmannian. Um, and the evaluation map is just a given contact structure is sent to the plane over the point Y naught. Um, okay, so then given some surface family, uh, we can associate to it a degree. Um, so this degree is just, you consider the family map, you compose by the evaluation map, uh, and this gives you a smooth map between uh, closed surfaces, and these are classified by the degree, uh, which is an integer. Um, this is what we call the degree of a surface family. Um, and um, a particularly simple situation is when we have a surf, uh, when the surface is equal to the two sphere and we consider a linear contact sphere uh, as before. In other words, a family uh, given by a linear combination of contact forms, which happen to be contact forms. Uh, so in this case, the degree uh, which we will denote D um, is always plus or minus one. Um, so um, the main result about the U action on the families invariant is the following. If we have a surface family, uh, then if you act by U on the families contact invariant, what you see is the degree times the contact invariant for a single contact structure in your family. Um, and in fact, there's a, a general formula uh, for you know, any arbitrary n, not just closed surfaces, uh, but uh, let's, just, uh, let's just focus on this, on this case for this talk. Um, yeah, so if, um, for example, if you consider the three manifolds given by quotients of S3 by finite circle groups of SU2, with the S2 families of contact structures that we defined earlier, then theorem one um, is, uh, shows because the degree of these families is non-zero and these contact invariants are non-zero either. It, it implies that in fact, uh, these families invariants uh, are non-vanishing. Yeah, so, um, this theorem uh, often gives obstructions to existence of surface families of non-zero degree. And a simple example to have in mind is the following. Um, let's consider the so-called, uh, a so-called Briscorn uh, homology sphere, um, which is given by the intersection of this uh, fine variety in C3, uh, which um, you, can, you can see is smooth away from the origin and has a singularity at the origin. Um, okay, so the free manifold is given by intersecting um, this uh, four dimensional uh, space with, uh, with the sphere of, of very small radius. Um, so this is called the link of the singularity at the origin. And, Manifolds like this always carry a canonical contact structure uh, given by the field of complex tangencies. 
as I defined before. Um, and, um, you know, one can go and try to compute the flare homology of, uh, of these spaces. And what you see in this case is the following. Um, the, the flare homology of, of, of this space consists of a tower of C's, um, and each C is mapped isomorphically by the U map onto the next one up until a uh, top uh, C. Um, and then there is this uh, lonely uh, summon on the other side uh, on which there is no U action going on. And well, it turns out that this summon contains the single contact invariant. And this is non-zero because it's symplectically feelable. Um, so uh, theorem one, so okay, so we, we can, so we see that this contact invariant is not in the image of U. And by theorem one, this implies that there cannot be surface families of contact structures uh, that have degree non-zero uh, in, in, this, in this example. And um, in fact, this example uh, generalizes much more um, if you consider the link of uh, an isolated normal non-rational singularity of a complex surface, um, then there is a recent result of Bodnar and Plamenevskaya that says that in this case also the single contact invariant is not in the image of you. Um, and we can also conclude that there's no surface families of non-zero degree. Um, and you know, just for comparison, recall that the AD singularities, which are rational, uh, have links that do admit S2 families of non-zero degree. Uh, yeah, so I won't really define uh, these terms. Uh, sorry, that's a different topic. Um, okay, um, the second result I wanna mention, uh, although I won't really use it very much, um, is that the contact invariant, the families invariant, in fact, uh, vanishes on the image of this map. So recall that um, we have this, this nice vibration with total space diff and uh, base uh, uh, space of contact structures. Uh, so we have an induced map in, uh, we have an induced map in, 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 in all homotopy groups. And uh, in fact, the families invariant will vanish on the image of this map uh, whenever j is uh, at least one. Um, and um, yeah, I was planning to give this uh, application to finding uh, so-called exotic loops of contact homorphisms, uh, which is just a nice inter interesting like, uh, contact phenomenon. Uh, but I feel like uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this example, but you can ask me uh, later on if, if you want. Okay, um, so um, the plan for the remainder of the talk is that I'm gonna sketch the construction of this uh, family's uh, contact invariant and try to prove the first theorem uh, that I stated. Um, so for this, let me do some, uh, let, let me give some uh, background on what monopole FLIR homology is. Um, okay, so um, these FLIR groups were defined by Schrangheimer and Murfka um, uh, in its most uh, simple way you can associate to, they give you a, a map from uh, closed oriented spin C uh, free manifolds uh, to modules over uh, the ring of uh, polynomials in a variable U. Um, there's much more structure to them, but uh, that's what we will care uh, for the purpose of this talk. Um, yeah, so let me give some basic uh, idea of how you can construct this group, uh, but uh, I will in fact give some sort of watered down definition of, of these groups, uh, since in fact going through uh, the actual definition would take uh, inevitably too much time. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of have to hide some things under the rug. Um, but the basic idea is the following. Um, you start by choosing some Riemannian metric on Y. Um, and from this, you can produce a cylindrical metric on this 
four manifold, which is just an infinite cylinder. Um, and you can also produce a translation invariant spin C structure on the cylinder induced by the spin C structure S. Uh, so, you know, in case you're not familiar with what spin C structures are, uh, uh, just uh, bear in mind that uh, you can uh, you can understand them in, ter in terms of concrete uh, geometric data. Uh, so this data is uh, first the so-called spinner bundle, uh, which is the sum of two Hermitian rank two bundles, uh, the positive and the negative one. Um, and then there is uh, so-called uh, Clifford action, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, a morphism of, of the, from the cotangent bundle. Um, to the bundle of uh, skew adjoint uh, traceless endomorphisms of the spinner bundle, satisfying uh, the usual uh, Clifford identity. Um, yeah, so provided with the data of a spin C structure, you can go on and write down the cyber witten monopole equations on this non compact four manifold. Um, so these equations are written down for a pair consisting of a connection, a spin C connection on, on the spinner bundle um, and, a, and a section of the positive spinner bundle. Um, yeah, and the, question, the equations uh, take this form. Uh, maybe you've seen them in different notations, so let me just clarify what some of these things mean. Um, so um, here, A uh, is a connection on the spinner bundle um, so in particular, you get an induced connection, which I denote by A to the power of T on the second exterior power of the positive spinner bundle. Um, okay, and this denotes the self-dual part of its curvature. Uh, the Clifford action naturally extends to all uh, uh, ex um, exterior powers of the cotangent bundle, and uh, this term then gives you an endomorphism. Of, of the positive spinner bundle. Uh, this term is also an endomorphism of the positive spinner bundle, and this part is its traceless part. And this is the Dirac operator associated to your connection. Okay, um, so these are the equations. Um, any, any questions about uh, these things? Um, yeah, so these are the equations, and then we will um, consider the following moduli spaces. Um, so the moduli space consists of pairs, connection and spinner, um, up to uh, okay, up to the action of a suitable group of gauge transformations. Um, so these pairs must, must satisfy the cyber witten monopole equations, which I abbreviate by just writing SW, and they must have, uh, they must satisfy certain asymptotics uh, you know, in order to get a uh, smooth finite dimensional uh, moduli space. Um, so yeah, what are these asymptotics? Okay, so A and B here, um, they, they stand for translation invariant cyber witten monopoles on R cross infinity, uh, in R cross Y. In other words, just solutions of these equations, uh, which are in addition translation invariant. Um, and we consider them up to the action of gauge. Um, okay, so yeah, the asymptotics are that uh, the monopoles must, uh, must approach uh, these two critical points, uh, these, these two translation invariant monopoles along the two ends um, in a suitable sense. And um, yeah, we'll refer to such translation invariant monopoles as critical points, as uh, you know, this story has a, has a more serious interpretation. Um, yeah, I might just call them critical points. Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm really hiding loads of things under the rug. Uh, there's, there's, many, there's many problems with this construction. In particular, there is, uh, you know, there is this gauge group action uh, which on reducible configurations, in other words, configurations where the spinner is identically zero, uh, acts, with, uh, acts with stabilizer uh, equal to S1, uh, the circle. Um, you know, and this prevents this space from being 
uh, smooth uh, near their reducible locus. Um, yeah, so in practice, the true definition has to be modified. Uh, and uh, yeah, what, I, what I'm telling you is not, uh, you know, you shouldn't take it too seriously. This is just the basic idea. Um, yeah, but you know, you just play the game, it's all fine. Then we can uh, define this uh, chain complex, um, which is freely generated by critical points. Um, and in here we have uh, this, uh, we can define a differential, uh, which is given by, uh, you know, which you know, acting on A, what it does is it counts points in the zero dimensional components of uh, these moduli spaces. So what I mean, what do I mean by this? Um, so the thing on the top is the moduli space over the infinite cylinder. And this has an R action uh, by translation uh, in the time coordinate. Uh, so this is just the quotient by this R action. Um, and the, the differential is just given by counting points in the zero dimensional connected components of these moduli spaces and indexing this count by critical points. Okay. And you know, if we had set up things uh, properly, this would actually square to zero. Uh, so we would get a chain complex. And to that we can associate homology and cohomology groups, uh, homology by taking the duo of this chain complex uh, as usual. Um, okay, any questions about this? Uh, can you explain the idea? Why is del square equals zero? Uh, yeah. Um, so the basic idea is that um, you consider this moduli space. Um, and yeah, you consider, uh, you consider moduli spaces like this, uh, which have dimension one, and you try to compactify them. And uh, what you will see is that the compactification has the structure of a topological manifold with boundary. Um, and uh, you know, like any topological manifold with boundary, the net count of its boundary points with appropriate signs is equal to zero. And uh, enumerating this, in, in, in the enumeration of the boundary points of this compactification is what gives you the identity. Uh, yeah, so you might, uh, um, you might have seen this in, in, in the context of Morse theory. Um, and it is, it is uh, essentially the same idea. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so these are the monopole third homology groups. And I'm gonna talk of the module structure now. Um, yeah, so there's, um, um, okay, as I said, I'm really uh, hiding some things here and you know, there's this extra S1 symmetry that I'm not really considering. Uh, and well, as a byproduct of, of this, uh, there is this module structure, in fact. Uh, so anyway, uh, the definition is as follows. Um, you know, one, one can give many, definition, many definitions of this module structure. You can, you can interpret it as evaluating natural cohomology classes over your module space. Uh, but I'm gonna give a very uh, concrete definition that uh, will be more, more suitable for our purpose. Um, so um, yeah, the idea is to count monopoles with a point constraint. So what do I mean by this? Uh, we fix some point in this, uh, in this four manifold and a trivialization of the spinner bundle over that point, uh, of the positive spinner bundle over that point. And then inside the moduli space uh, over a cylinder, we consider those monopoles that in addition satisfy this point constraint. In other words, in this trivialization, what we want is that the component in this summand is equal to zero, okay? So that, that is the point constraint. Um, and I will associate this picture to this kind of uh, moduli space. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, similarly as before, we can now try to count uh, the pseudo-dimensional compo pseudo components of these moduli spaces. Um, 
and we index this count by critical points. Um, and uh, this, in fact, defines a, a chain map, and therefore it will give you induced maps in homology and cohomology. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the rough idea behind the the U action in in monopolar homology. Um, okay, and, and any questions about about this? Okay, um, yeah. So, so I thought it would be good good to give uh, some details about the construction of the of the contact invariant uh, of Kronheimer and Mrufka, uh to see you know what what's the matter about a contact structure that allows us to do some like, cyber witten theory with it. Um, so yeah, let's consider some contact structure psi on 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 closed three manifold y. Um, Okay, so the idea behind the, uh, the construction, okay, so the, the outline uh, of the construction uh, is roughly the following. Uh, to this manifold, we're gonna associate this non-compact or manifold, K, okay, uh, which you can see has boundary uh, given by minus Y, in other words, Y with its natural orientation reversed. And, um, we will use the contact structure to produce uh, the following uh, data. First, there will be an almost uh, Kähler structure on the four manifold K. Uh, what I mean by almost Kähler structure is, um, is just a triple consisting of a symplectic form, an almost complex structure, and a metric. And uh, you know, uh, symplectic form and the complex structure. Uh, so the, yeah, the almost complex structure might not be integrable, and that's what the almost means. Um, and uh, yeah, the symplectic structure must be compatible with the, with the complex structure uh, in the usual sense. Um, okay, so yeah, so we will obtain an almost scalar structure on K. Uh, we will see that there's gonna be a spin structure on this end, uh, and Furthermore, we will be able to find some canonical configuration uh, for this spin C structure. And this will do as a replacement for the non-compactness of K, as we will see. Um, and yeah, then one just has to apply the TQFT property and one should be able to produce this invariant. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go one by one uh, through these points. Uh, so the first one is the almost killer structure on this four manifold. Um, we start by choosing some auxiliary data. Um, this is a contact form for the contact structure and then some complex structure on the contact distribution, uh, you know, which induces the same orientation that the contact distribution already carry. Um, okay, so then the almost, the almost scalar structure on this manifold uh, is the following. Uh, the symplectic form is given by so-called symplectization of the contact form. Okay, so we consider this expression, um, which you can expand to this. Uh, yeah, and, and observe that uh, this is, of course, closed, and it is non-degenerate as it squares to this uh, positive uh, volume form on the four manifold. Okay, so this form is actually symplectic. Um, okay, um, the complex structure is defined as follows, the, the almost complex structure is defined as follows. Okay, so we already have this complex structure and the contact distribution, and we wish to extend, uh, extend it. Uh, so there's two extra direction we need to define this almost complex structure along. And, um, yeah, let me start by saying that if you have a contact manifold together with a contact form, then there is a canonical direction uh, complementary to the contact distribution. And this is the, the direction of the rape vector field on Y. Okay, so this is a vector field which is uh, uniquely determined by these two properties. Okay, the 
contact form evaluated on R is identically one. And if you contract this two form by R, it is identically zero. Uh, and then we choose to extend this almost complex, almost complex structure uh, by the identities you see here. Uh, one can now check that this symplectic form and this complex structure are compatible in the sense that if you define this tensor, it gives you a Riemannian metric. Um, and this Riemannian metric is in fact a conical metric. Uh, in other words, it's just given by dt squared plus t squared times some metric on the free manifold. Uh, and this metric on the free manifold, uh, I'm not going to write it down explicitly, uh, but you know, it uh, suffices to know it's just some canonical metric on y that you can construct from, uh, from the data of a complex of, of a contact structure, contact form, and a complex structure on the contact distribution. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's good to have in mind the, the following very basic example, which is what happens when you start with the standard contact three sphere. Um, well, then if you make the right choices along the way, what you will end up with is the standard Kähler structure on R4. Uh, so yeah, um, observe that R4 minus uh, the unit ball uh, is the, you know, equipped with the flat Euclidean metric is the cone over the three sphere uh, under this identification. Okay, so what we see is just the, you know, the standard Kähler structure on R4. Um, okay, so we have defined an almost Kähler structure. Uh, then we can produce a spin C structure on K. Uh, and you know, in general, whenever you have some uh, almost Kähler structure, uh, you have a canonical spin C structure. And uh, yeah, in this case, the, the spinner bundles are given by, are given concretely by by the following. Okay, so it's a trivial summon uh, plus uh, this bundle of uh, zero two forms. And yeah, similarly for the negative spinner bundle. And the Clifford action can be uh, described in various ways. Uh, you, can, you can define it as the symbol of the following differential operator. Uh, so it's just, the operator is just the sum of the del bar and del bar are joint operators acting on these spaces of, of forms. Uh, and you can give more concrete description of this action, but uh, let's not worry about it. Uh, okay, any questions about, about this before I move on? Okay. Um, it turns out that we now have, we can now find a canonical configuration over this four manifold. Um, so recall that the positive spinner bundle is given by this. So we can now consider the spinner, uh, which is just identically one on the first summon. Uh, and then it is a fact that um, there exists a unique uh, spin C connection on the spinner bundle uh, for which the Dirac operator annihilates um, the, the canonical spinner. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, yeah, this, this is equivalent to saying that the form is, you know, that omega is symplectic, uh, which we are assuming. Uh, yeah, so up to gauge, uh, you can determine this pair by the following three conditions. Uh, the first is that the canonical spinner is a minus 2i uh, eigenvector for the Clifford action of the symplectic form. Uh, the second is that it has unit norm. And the third is uh, the condition that the Dirac operator annihilates uh, this canonical spinner. Uh, yeah, and this will, be, um, this will be useful when we define the family's version of this invariant. Okay. Um, you know, so I have defined, I have gone through the two points one, two, and three. And what's left now is to follow the TQFT uh, property. Uh, 
and produce, uh, and then we would be able to get the invariant I promised. Uh, yeah, so this, this would be very similar uh, if K was uh, a compact manifold with boundary. Uh, okay, so yeah, one starts by attaching a cylindrical end uh, to K. So we consider uh, this half infinite cylinder um, and we attach it to, uh, we glue it to K along, uh, along their common boundary. Uh, and then we, yeah, we, we want to extend the metric to the whole of C plus uh, in a way which is cylindrical uh, on, the, on the end C. Uh, okay, so the picture is this. Uh, this is our four manifold. Um, um, yeah, and now we can also extend the spin C structure um, uh, that we had over K over the whole of C plus uh, in a way which is translation invariant along the cylindrical end. Um, yeah, so we have a four manifold, we have a spin C structure over it, and now we will write down the cyber witten equations um, again. So yeah, so for a pair uh, over C plus, um, we consider the same equations as before. Uh, the right hand side is the same. Uh, so the left hand side is the same, uh, but now we consider this perturbation term, uh, which is um, known as uh, Taub's perturbation. Uh, yeah, so just observe that this is the same as what you see on the left, but we are plugging in the canonical configuration. And um, well, since, since this term is really only defined over the conical n, uh, you know, we, we need to smooth it out. Uh, in order to extend it over the whole of C plus. And that's why we include this, you know, some, some cutoff function uh, in order to do that. Uh, yeah, so in particular, this perturbation implies that the canonical configuration is a solution to the equations, but just over the conical end. Uh, and yeah, that's, that, that's the role it plays. Okay, so now we can consider uh, moduli spaces uh, of uh, pairs uh, that satisfy the cyber witten monopole equations that I just wrote down uh, with asymptotics to a critical point over the cylindrical end. And over the conical end, I require that they approach uh, you know, a canonical, uh, the, the canonical configuration that we have over this end. Um, and yeah, um, it turns out that this end, uh, that, you know, we have some nice compactness results uh, over this end so that it actually behaves like a compact uh, for manifold boundary. Um, okay, so this is the moduli space. And uh, yeah, we define the contact invariant again by counting the zero dimensional components in this moduli space and indexing the count by critical points. And uh, again, it is a fact that uh, uh, this is a, is a closed uh, uh, co-chain uh, so that you get a cohomology class uh, in, in, in monopole third homo cohomology. And this will in fact be independent of uh, the choices that we have made along the way uh, in a suitable sense. Okay, um, so this is the uh, contact invariant for a single contact structure. Uh, are, are there any questions? Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna now sketch uh, how you can extend this to a family's invariant. Uh, I will give some details, but uh, unfortunately you have to add a, a a whole layer of technical stuff. Uh, so I will just sketch the main points. Um, however, the rough, the rough idea is the following. Um, you know, uh, okay, so recall that uh, the family's invariant is a map from the space of homotopy classes of maps from N into the space of contact structure, taking values in the Fleur cohomology of Y. 
And what we will do is to a family, uh, we will associate again an invariant given by counting points in families moduli spaces um, and indexing this count by critical points. Um, yeah, so what are the main uh, points uh, to have in mind about the construction of this families uh, moduli space? Um, well, um, you know, since we have a family of contact structures, uh, we now need, uh, you know, we, we now want uh, a family of almost scalar structures on the on the end k, and this is done in a similar way. Um, but for technical reasons, uh, you will need uh, to have the metrics over the cylindrical part uh, fixed. In other words, we don't really want a family of metrics going on over the cylindrical end. Um, yeah, and this, this condition is needed to, to be able to set, you know, to, to, uh, to be able to converge to, uh, to, be, to, to be able to make sense uh, uh, of what it means for a monopole to converge to a critical point over the cylindrical end. Anyway, it's just, it, it's a small technical thing. Um, yeah, so we also want a, a family of uh, spin C structures over, uh, over the manifold C plus. Uh, uh, subject to the following requirements. Uh, first, we want a spinner bundle which is fixed. In other words, we don't really want a family of spinner bundles, we just want one that works for all. Uh, but the Clifford action uh, may depend on, on, on N. Uh, we do allow that. And um, yeah, over the cylindrical N, uh, we, must we, we, we must have uh, the usual familiar situation uh, where both the spinner bundle and Clifford action are fixed and the spin structure is translation invariant. Uh, yeah, and with some care you can, you can obtain all of these things. Uh, yeah, uh, and in addition you want a corresponding family of canonical configurations for this family of spin structures. And, and what this means is that, you know, you want a family of such configurations for which uh, the spinner is a minus two i eigenvector for the Clifford action of the corresponding symplectic form. Uh, yeah, so recall we had a family of almost killer structures and this is the family of symplectic forms in there. Uh, they must have a unit length and the Dirac operator uh, must annihilate, annihilate the, the canonical spinner. Okay, so this is roughly the main idea. And um, now can again now we can again write uh, a, mod, a modular space of monopoles, uh, satisfying uh, you know triples in this case of connection spinner and a point in N, uh, which satisfy the cyber witten monopole equations with together with Taubes's perturbation. Uh, in this case, the equation will will vary, will depend on the point in N, uh, because our family of Clifford actions does depend on, on N. Uh, but, you know, we can still write down the equations and they make perfect sense. And yeah, we will again consider the same asymptotics. Uh, in other words, convergence to the canonical uh, configurations uh, over the conical N and, oops, sorry, and uh, to a translation invariant monopole over the cylindrical end. Okay, so um, this is the rough idea behind the construction of the families invariant. Uh, are there any questions about it? Okay, um, so in the last five minutes, I'd like to um, sketch uh, the proof of the main theorem, which I stated before. Uh, so recall that what this said is that we ha if we have a, a, surf a surface family of contact structures, uh, here sigma was a closed oriented surface, um, then if you act by U on the family's contact invariant, uh, what you see is the degree of the family times the single uh, contact invariant. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of the proof uh, is to consider uh, a cyber-witten moduli space 
uh, with a moving point constraint. So let me uh, explain what I mean by this. Um, yeah, if you consider the spinner bundle over C+, it turns out that it has a natural splitting as a sum of a trivial line bundle and some line bundle L. Uh, so now we can do the following. Uh, we fix some base point in Y and um, we can consider inside this product, in other words, this is the family's moduli space and this is R. So inside here, we can consider uh, a moduli space consisting of uh, uh, quadruples A, phi, U and T, um, where U is a point in the surface, R is, is, is the time. Um, and this must satisfy the cyber between equations as before uh, with the same asymptotics from before. And in, in addition, they must satisfy this point constraint. Okay, so this, uh, you think of this as a moving point constraint as it depends on the time coordinate. Um, yeah, so this, this constraint means that with respect to this natural splitting, the component in this first summon is identically zero. Um, that is the constraint. Um, so yeah, the picture I will associate to this moduli space uh, is, is the following, where, this, where the you know, dashed line uh, uh, is meant to represent this moving, this moving uh, point constraint. Uh, yeah, so the, the main, uh, f yeah, the, the, the main idea of the proof is to compactify this modular space. So um, first observe that uh, uh, this modular space carries a natural projection to sigma cross R. And um, yeah, what it turns out is that we can compactify this moduli space over sigma cross the extended uh, real line. Um, and I will denote by um, this, the projection in the compactification. Um, in general, this space um, uh, doesn't have a very nice structure. It's just a space stratified by manifolds. Um, but when its dimension is one, um, then it happens to be a topological uh, manifold with boundary. Um, and uh, its interior, it's just the moduli space we, we just defined. Um, and the boundary points are so-called uh, broken cyber within monopoles uh, of the following three types. Um, first, one can have uh, the following kind of breaking or degeneration at finite time. Um, you know, we, we have a sequence of monopoles where the time coordinate converges to some finite number. Uh, then it can break down as a pair of monopoles, uh, one over this infinite cylinder on one uh, over, the, over the manifold uh, with the conical end uh, and satisfying uh, you know, a moving point constraint. Um, another kind of uh, degeneration we can see, uh, that we see is that is when the time coordinate goes to minus infinity. Um, in this case, uh, you know, the, the picture is just like follow the, you follow the dotted line uh, in the minus infinite direction. And what will happen in this case is that you will see uh, a, degener a degeneration um, where uh, your monopole will, your sequence of monopoles will converge to a monopole over this cylinder with a point constraint and a monopole over C plus. Um, yeah, so uh, over the fiber at infinity uh, in the compactification, what you need to add is gonna be uh, broken monopoles. Uh, in these spaces. Um, so this is the, you know, the space that we count points in to define the U action 
and this is the family's moduli space. Uh, okay, so the interesting kind of um, boundary points are, are the ones of type three. Um, um, so the main idea is the following. Um, you know, if we have, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, we have this point constraint and we also require a, a convergence to the canonical configuration. And this will imply, uh, this will in fact um, uh, impose the point constraint on the canonical configuration. Okay, so what we expect is that this limit is actually zero. So, it, you know, that the first factor in this limit is equal to zero. Um, it turns out that these canonical configurations have some kind of scale invariance property uh, that in fact allow us to conclude that this holds for any time, in particular time one. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to, to finish if that's okay. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so let's define this, this map, okay, um, which goes from our surface to the projectivization of the positive spinner bundle over the fiber uh, in this, uh, at this point. Uh, and the map just associates to a given point uh, the, um, you know, the line spanned by the canonical configuration. So, you know, this condition uh, is the same as saying that U lies over the, lies on the fiber of this, uh, of this point in the projectivization. Uh, okay, so if, you know, if nice transversality holds, and uh, this is in fact a regular value of the map E, uh, then you expect that if you add uh, this, uh, monopoles on the fiber over infinity, the resulting space will be compact. Uh, well, and in fact, it, it will be. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so how does the degree come up in all of this? Um, yeah, so recall that the degree is given by the composition of uh, these two maps, the families map and the evaluation map. Uh, yeah, so the key result is that the degree of this map, uh, of the map E, is equal to the degree of the family. Uh, and the rough idea behind the proof is just, it's to follow uh, the proof of, uh, you know, why the two sphere is diffeomorphic to the complex projective line. Uh, and this is some um, exercise in uh, some, some small computation in, in like uh, linear algebra and representation theory. Um, yeah, so the rough idea is the following. Uh, the Grassmannian is identified with the sphere in the cotangent fiber uh, just by taking the kernel. And this sphere, you can identify it uh, with the sphere of radius square root of two inside of the bundle of cell dual two forms on K. Sorry, not bundle, like, this, is just, this is just a fiber, right? Uh, and this is given by this map. Uh, and now these two spaces are identified by sending some self dual two form to the minus two i eigenspace of its Clifford action. Um, so under this identification of spaces, uh, the two maps will in fact uh, agree. So they have the same degree. Um, uh, so the conclusion of the proof is the following. We will consider critical points um, for which the moduli space has dimension one. Um, then like for any compact orientable uh, manifold of dimension one, its total count of boundary points uh, is equal to zero uh, with, the, with appropriate signs. Um, and if you index this count by critical points, uh, you obtain zero. And well, by the description of the three kinds of boundary points, um, this sum splits into three parts corresponding to the three kinds of boundary points. So the first one will amount for an exact summon. The second will give you u times the family's invariant. And the third one will give you the degree times the contact invariant uh, of a single contact structure. And when you pass to cohomology, um, this gives you the required identity. Um, and I think I'll stop here because I'm over time. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Any questions for Juan? I have a question about your application to ADE singularities that you mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. So you said that um, on, so if I take S3 mod Z2, for example, mm -hmm. there is an S2 family of uh, contact structures. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that the same as the hyperkeda sphere on C2 mod plus minus one? Uh, on, uh, yeah. So. What happens is that all of these families that are described on links of ADE singularities, um, they arise in some sense as the boundary of the hypercalic structure on, on C2 quotient mm -hmm. by gamma. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you can make that more precise. Um, okay, okay. And uh, so can you rule out um, some, some crazier family? So not an S2 family, but like an, think, think of some other surface? Uh, I mean, not not in the not in the case of the three sphere or these quotients. Uh, yeah, but as I described in this, when it, yeah, when you have uh, non-rational singularities and you look at at their links, uh, yeah, these are the results that I mentioned. Then in that case, you don't have uh, you don't have families. You don't have surface families of non-zero degree uh, by, by by the main theorem. And like, can you can you give a thirty seconds explanation? What's a non-rational singularity? Because uh, I didn't know that. I, I mean, like a rational singularity. Uh, I'll define that maybe. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. The basic idea is that um, you know you can uh, yeah. Whenever you have a normal singularity, you can always find some uh, nicer solution where the uh, you know where the exceptional uh, divisor consists of curves that all intersect pairwise uh, transversely and so on. Um, yeah, and in the in the rational singular in the rational singularity case, uh, what you see is uh, uh, you only see you know p ones. Uh, you only see rational curves in this exceptional mm. uh, divisor. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Comments? Okay, if that's not the case, then uh, let's thank Juan again very much.